Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, uh, we, we will see the Engels theorem and Lee's theorem proof. Okay. So, let me begin with uh, recalling the invariance lemma that we actually saw last time. So, I will briefly actually explain the core idea in the proof because invariance lemma plays a vital role in both the Engels theorem and Lee's theorem proofs. Okay, here is the statement. <coughs> Let uh, G be some linear Lie algebra. So, this V is uh, so non zero finite dimensional vector space over complex numbers okay. and A be some ideal inside G. So, then let lambda be a weight of uh, e, weight for A. So, that means it is a functional and the corresponding uh, weight space V lambda. So, that is non-zero. So, the, you take V lambda. So, which is uh, those vectors V in V such that when you act A on this vector V, you get uh, lambda of A some scalar times V, which we call it lambda of A uh, for all a in capital A. What actually uh, invariance lemma says? If you take this weight space corresponding to the weight weight uh, lambda, so this is called the weight space corresponding to lambda in A star. Okay. So this weight space is actually it's easy to see it is invariant under capital A. The invariance uh, lemma says that this weight space is indeed G invariant. So, then what is the conclusion? V lambda is actually G invariant. So, this is the conclusion of invariance lemma. So, this is what we proved uh, last time. So, we actually uh, just outline the core idea of this proof okay, which is actually very important. So, to prove this uh, invariance lemma we observed the following thing. Okay. You start with uh, some element A in A and then uh, Y in G. Okay. So, then what we needed to prove? So, to prove that this capital V lambda is G invariant you also take some vector V in V lambda. So, then for this data we need to prove that if you apply y on v, so then okay, this y v should be again element of v lambda. So, that means for that a if you apply it on y v we should get lambda of a y v. Okay. So, this should be true for all a in capital A. So, this equation tells that y v is again element of v lambda. Okay. To prove that, so what we actually observed the very first observation is that A y v if you use the commutator relation then this is nothing but y a v plus bracket a y v. So, since bracket a y which is again element of capital A as A being an ideal. So, this is going to give us so this equation. So, lambda of A y v plus lambda of bracket A v times v. So, in order to prove uh, A y v is same as lambda A y v. So, we need to only prove that uh, lambda of A v is 0 for all sorry A y. A y is 0 for all A in A and Y in G. Okay. So, this is the thing we need we need to prove for all A in A and Y in G. So, to in order to do that what we did? So, we wanted to realize this bracket A Y as commutator A Y minus Y A. So, if we are able to actually find a invariance subspace of capital V. So, that is actually invariant under both A and Y. So, what is the task? So, the task was find a subspace U of V which is 
invariant under both a and y ok. So, fix a in capital A and y in G. So, then this is what we want to buy and of course, that also should uh, uh, somewhat <coughs> involve uh, the information that we have started with that is the V in V lambda ok. So, that when you do the computation on that invariant space U uh, the, the especially the computing the matrix of A and matrix of Y and the matrix of uh, the bracket A Y on this U. So, that should actually have this uh, information lambda of A Y ok. For that what we did we actually took uh, the smallest invariant space ok Y invariant space uh, generated by uh, that vector V ok. So, you took u to be the span of c. So, which is v y v y square v and so on. So, we also saw that there is a k such that this will be exactly given by span of v y v v y v etcetera y power k minus 1 v. So, this will become a basis. So, there exists k in n ok maybe union 0. So, so there is ok I can assume to be n such that. So, this is a basis basis of u. So, then uh, what we actually proved we proved that for any z ok not only for a for any z for any z in capital A this z actually maps u to u ok. So, the way we proved if you take z and apply it on some y or v then we, we observe that this is actually equal to some scalar times ok. So, let me explicitly write what is that scalar. So, that is uh, lambda z of y power r v plus some term u where this u will come from the span of v y v etcetera y power r minus 1 v ok. So, this was the computation that we did. So, this is the very crucial computation. So, that was already done. So, basically you have to construct a invariant subspace invariant under both a and y. Uh, which is actually somewhat generated by this V ok. So, for that first you start with Y invariant space generated by V. So, and then you just uh, because A being ideal will give us that for any z uh, this uh, U will be invariant ok. So, then if then we have seen that uh, if you calculate the matrix of z with respect to the basis. So, for this uh, U so this is the basis. So, then we saw that this is actually of the form upper triangular with diagonal entries being lambda widget. So, this is some in particularly the trace of this z restricted to u is nothing but the dimension of u times lambda widget ok. So, now when you when you restrict z to be this bracket a y which is an element of capital A since both a maps u to u and uh, y maps u to u. So, we get the trace of bracket a y restricted to u is 0. On the other hand you get uh, from the earlier computation it is dimension u times lambda of bracket a y ok. So, that immediately tells you that lambda of bracket a y is 0 for all a in capital A and y in G. So, this indeed proves if you go back to our original calculation. So, this indeed proves that a y v is same as y a v ok. So, this is what it proves. So, that is exactly lambda of a y v ok. So, we ver verified this uh, condition. So, this is how we actually indeed proved the invariance lemma. So, now we will actually see various applications of invariance lemma. As a first application, we will prove a elementary an elementary fact from the linear algebra. Okay, so let me state that. 
so this maybe you can actually uh, maybe I will state it as a lemma. So this lemma I am just just stating it as as a result. It, this is actually indeed uh, won't be used. Maybe one can uh, use this to characterize nilpotent Lie algebras. Maybe I will come to that later. Let me call it uh, this lemma. So what it says? So you have let's say uh, two operators acting on a vector space V. Okay. So let x and y. So they are endomorphisms of V such that both x and y commutes with the commutator x y. Okay. So, then one can prove that the bracket x y must be nilpotent. Okay. So, this is some uh, necessary condition to get uh, nilpotent operators. Okay. I will advise you to actually recall various characterization of uh, nilpotent operators, so which will be useful uh, throughout this uh, course. Okay. For example, one of the characterization says, uh, so how do you prove this? So to verify the bracket x y is being nilpotent, uh, we need to only check that because we are working over complex numbers, uh, it does not have any non-zero eigenvalue. Okay. So let us say lambda being eigen value. So, lambda being eigen value for this bracket x y. So, then we can construct uh, this uh, lambda eigen space. Okay. This is those vector v in v such that when you apply x y on v you get exactly lambda v. Okay. So, this is the subspace that we are talking considering. So, now what we can do? We can take uh, this uh, Lie subalgebra generated by x and y. Okay. So, if we take uh, Lie subalgebra generated by x and y, you can see that. Uh, so, it must be, so it must be uh, this subspace. So, you take uh, G, so which is Lie subalgebra generated by x and y. So, since both x and y commutes, so this will be this three dimensional space. Okay. So, maybe like I did not uh, actually introduce what is uh, subalgebra generated by some subset, maybe I will introduce this later. Maybe here it is not hard to check, uh, you can take uh, the span of these three elements okay, x, y and then the bracket x y. Okay. So, this is we will check this is actually a subalgebra of G L V. So, if you actually uh, compute the Lie products, okay, so because this is being actually subspace of G L of V, so the Jacobi identity we do not need to worry. So, all we need to verify is the successive brackets should be inside. Okay. So, let us check whether uh, those brackets are again inside G. So, for example, if I take x and y and then take the bracket, so it will be again inside there. Similarly, for y x. So, now all we need to check what will happen if you go further uh, up. Okay. For example, if you take x x x y, since x and x y commute, so this is 0. And similarly, what will happen? The y x y again that is 0. So, that is the given hypothesis. So, now in particularly if you take further uh, anything, so there is nothing actually more. So, so this computation tells us that G is a Lie subalgebra of G L V. Okay. Now, it is clear that uh, this span of the single element x y. So, this is actually is an ideal inside G okay. because if you take any element here that actually leaves this uh, subspace invariant by adjoint action. So, that means we can use the invariance lemma. So, what invariance lemma says for the ideal if you take uh, uh, this uh, 
lambda eigen space okay so that is the weight space so for this uh, capital a this w is nothing but uh, lambda okay weight space so in particularly both x and y leaves w invariant okay so now you can see that since both uh, leaves x and y uh, both leaves w invariant so if you compute trace of the bracket x y on w so then this has to be x restricted to w times y restricted to w minus y restricted to w uh, times x restricted to w so that implies the trace must be zero restricted on w must be zero but on the other hand what is w w is lambda weight space okay or lambda eigen space so that means this xy acts as scalar so if you compute the trace on the other hand that will be dimension w times lambda so that is nothing but the trace of xy on w but our computation says this is zero so that implies lambda must be zero okay since uh, <coughs> lambda eigen space so w must be non zero so that means uh, lambda must be zero using this equation so this proves that uh, bracket xy must have like only zero eigen values so that means the bracket xy must be nilpotent so there are other ways to prove the same result maybe you can take it as a uh, challenge uh, to prove the same result using some elementary uh, elementary linear algebra results okay so i will leave it to think uh, leave it to you to think about it so let us now see uh, more applications of our invariant lemma so you can see that already invariant lemma is somewhat uh, very very nice so there are so many interesting facts one can prove using invariant lemma okay so now uh, let us actually prove uh, ingels theorem but uh, before getting into the original statement of ingels theorem so which i actually wrote it as uh, e1 so what is e1 so the first version of ingels theorem so if you take so let g be a five dimensional lie algebra over complex numbers so then the first statement says so g is nilpotent if and only if all elements are add nilpotent okay that means add x nilpotent for all x in g so that is same as saying all elements of g or add nilpotent so we already proved one way so this part is actually obvious so which we verified so we already verified so we need to prove the converse part okay we will see later so if you think about it okay uh, so this fact actually can be derived from the following fact okay so which i actually called it as e2 so g is uh, now take it to be a linear lie algebra okay so then so if you have this hypothesis okay so all elements of g are nilpotent as operators on okay capital v so then we can prove that g is nilpotent lie algebra okay but if you think about it the converse of this e2 this is actually not true okay so for example uh, there are uh, some nilpotent lie algebras okay even linear lie algebra so the trivial example okay the converse of e2 is not true 
So, what I mean by that we can easily produce an example of linear uh, Lie sub algebra which is nilpotent, but there is no way to conclude that the elements of G are nilpotent. So, for example, what we can do, do we can take uh, as an example just uh, C times identity okay, inside this GLV. So, this is the identity n by n identity matrix. So, then you can see that uh, this is actually one dimensional uh, Lie algebra okay, because i n commutes with i n. So, this is uh, identity matrix. So, clearly this is actually one dimensional abelian Lie algebra. So, that means this is nilpotent Lie algebra, okay. but there is no basis inside capital V for which this i n is actually like strictly upper triangular. So, in particularly it can be easily verified i n is not nilpotent. Okay. So, it is clear that i n is not nilpotent operator on capital. Okay. So, this is actually a slight warning. So, this uh, E 2 only the one way is true like if we assume that G is linearly subalgebra and then all the elements are nilpotent then we only get G is nilpotent it's not the converse. So, <coughs> if we think about it okay, this uh, version E 2 actually follows from uh, the following version. Okay. So, there is this uh, E 2 E 2 dash okay, which, uh, which is what we actually prove. Okay. So, you start with a vector space again you assume to be non-zero space. Okay. So, and uh, let us say G is sitting inside G L V which is uh, Lie sub algebra. Okay. Suppose each element of this G is uh, nilpotent linear transformation on V. Okay. So, assume that each element of G is a nilpotent transformation okay, of V. So, then what we can prove you we can prove that there exists a basis capital B of V such that. So, each element of this uh, G. Okay. So, if you take the matrix of X with respect to this basis B okay, for each element of okay, for all X in G. So, this matrix X with respect to B. So, this will be strictly upper triangular. We, we say this dimension of V is here okay. and this is true for all X in X. So, you have a common basis B such that uh, the matrices of uh, each element of G with respect to this basis. Uh, will be strictly upper triangular. Okay. So, this is actually you can call it as a structure theorem of uh, finite dimensional nilpotent uh, Lie algebras. Why? Because we have actually uh, we indeed uh, realize that any uh, linear Lie subalgebra, any linear Lie nilpotent subalgebra as a subalgebra of uh, this uh, strictly upper triangular matrices. So, we already saw that any subalgebra of this strictly upper triangular matrix must be nilpotent because that strictly upper triangular matrix is itself nilpotent. Okay. So, we are indeed uh, in, in some sense proving the converse, but of course, uh, <coughs> I am a lying a bit because we are not proving the converse as uh, like as I stated because if you start with an arbitrary Lie algebra. 
Okay, so then what happens? Uh, so far we have seen that only modulo the center we can embed that Lie algebra inside uh, some general linear Lie algebra. So that is exactly comes from the adjoint representation. So G modulo the center G will be isomorphic to add G. So, <coughs> but at least modulo the center this uh, E to dash tells you that you can uh, you can realize that as if it is if G is nilpotent then G modulo center G can be realized as subalgebra of the strictly upper triangular matrices. Okay, so that is what we have we have we can say from whatever we have proved so far. So now, uh, what is the motivation for this actually? So the motivation is actually comes from actually one-dimensional example. So if you start with some x in uh, endomorphism of V, you can take G to be C x. Okay, this is an abelian Lie algebra. So then, if x is nilpotent, then what will happen? So then uh, you can look at the Jordan form of this uh, x. Okay, so there exists a basis. So this is the Jordan canonical form. So there exists a basis uh, B such that uh, the matrix of X with respect to the basis will look like uh, strictly upper triangular. Okay. So actually, we don't need we don't we don't need to really use Jordan canonical form. This can be proved just uh, using induction on the dimension V. Okay. So I will leave it to you to check uh, uh, this fact. This is an easy fact from linear algebra. So now let us see how one can prove uh, Engels theorem. So to prove uh, this version E2 dash, so it is very clear E2 dash is actually giving you uh, this E2 okay, and E2 and E1 are equivalent. Okay. So now in order to prove uh, this E2 dash, we will actually make another proportion. Okay. So that proportion is actually somewhat going to tell you like, uh, so whatever I stated in E2 dash is true. Again, uh, you take V to be non-zero, and then G is being inside GL of V, such that each element of G is nilpotent uh, linear transformation. Of V. Then what we can prove? So if you take nilpotent operator, what is the important uh, uh, fact about the nilpotent operator? The kernel of that operator is always non-zero. That means zero is always an eigenvalue, and we have seen in uh, linear algebra the only eigenvalues are actually zero. So that means uh, one can expect in this case, if you want to prove that uh, this can be embedded inside strictly upper triangular matrix with respect to some basis. Then if you look at this strictly upper triangular matrix, the very first 1 1 th place the corner, so that will be 0. So that means some basis vector of this B, so that should be annihilated by all the elements of G, so that is what we are getting. Okay. So that is what one actually expects and that is what this proportion actually tells us. So if you start with a non-zero vector space G inside GL of V satisfying our hypothesis then we can prove that there exist a non-zero vector V in capital V such that each element of this G will kill that vector. Okay. So this is uh, one can actually, uh, so using this proportion it is easy to prove that uh, whatever I stated in E2 dash, maybe you should take it as exercise and then try to do. So for time being let us assume this proportion, let me tell you like our outline how one can prove E2 dash from the proportion. So if you have a vector V which is non-zero vector from capital V such that this XV is killed uh, is 0 for all X in G, then what you can do? You can actually take uh, this W, this is those vector inside V such that uh, x v is 0 for all x in g. Okay. So then this is a non-zero space. Okay. So then what do you can do? You can actually simply take v modulo w. Okay. This v modulo w the dimension of this is actually goes down. 
So, the dimension of this is strictly less than the dimension of V. So, now what you can do? You can use induction on the dimension of V to prove whatever you needed. So, for that what we need to do? We need to actually see that. So, each x in g actually induces a map okay, which we can call it x bar. So, for each x in g, so there is a map x bar that is actually defined from x modulo sorry v modulo w to v modulo w. Basically how it is defined? You take x bar and then apply it on some u plus w. So, this is just x u plus w. Okay. So, this is a well defined map why because suppose u plus w is same as u dash plus w then that will imply that u minus u dash is in w. So, that would imply that x actually will kill this u minus u dash. So, that means x u is same as x u dash. Okay. So, that means you get uh, x u plus w is same as x u dash plus w. So, so, there is this natural induced map x bar from v modulo w to v modulo w. If x is nilpotent, then it is easy to see that x bar is also nilpotent, okay, that I will leave it as exercise. So, since x is nilpotent, so that implies x bar is also nilpotent. So, now basically you consider this g dash which is those x bar such that x is coming from g. So, where x bar is in inside this endomorphism of g l of v. So, g l of v modulo w. So, it is easy to see this is again actually a Lie subalgebra of g l of v modulo w consisting of nilpotent operators. So, by induction on this dimension of this vector space. So, we conclude that there exists a basis. So, there exists a basis B of V modulo W such that. So, this x bar with respect to this basis lives inside okay, this looks like upper triangular. Maybe I will write the matrix. So, this is just strictly 0 and then star. Okay. So, now if you list this V as some V 1 plus W etcetera, some V k plus W. Okay. So, then you can see that you can actually take a basis of V as uh, basis of W and then you can also take this V 1 etcetera V k put together you can make a basis of V. Okay. So, start with the basis. u 1 etcetera u r of w. So, then one can check u 1 etcetera u r and then v 1 etcetera v k. So, that forms a basis of v. So, now if you just uh, look at the way actually we have chosen u i's. So, this x u i will be 0 for all x in g okay. and then this x v i okay. for example, x v 1 will be uh, 0 okay. that means this belongs to actually w. So, that is just a span of u 1 etcetera u r. Okay. So, that means x v 1 is some a 1 u 1 plus etcetera plus a r u r and similarly x v 2 will be <coughs> equal to. So, this is the matrix 0 star 0 0 okay, 0 etcetera star star 0 like that the matrix looks like. So, this x v 2 will be some scalar times v 1 plus okay, some elements from w and then some b 1 u 1 plus etcetera plus b r u 1 because the difference 
lies inside W and so on. Okay. So, that means if you arrange it in this way, so you can easily see that. So, this basis that you have actually constructed which is u1 etcetera ur and then v1 etcetera vk. So, with respect to this uh, basis each x looks actually upper triangular. Okay, so, that is very clear from the construction. So, these ui's are all 0. So, this first part okay, if you write this matrix, so the if you call it u1, u1, ur, v1, etcetera, vk, u2, ur, v1, etcetera, vk. So, this part of the matrix will be 0 and the second part. So, x v 1 is already a 1 etcetera a r. So, that will be filled here, but this is uh, r plus 1 okay, this part up to this part is 0. So, then then if you look at x v n this is all 0 and this entry is also 0. So, this is actually So, if you go to V2, so the V2 will be, so this is all some entries up to here and then this part is 0 because if you look at this there is no V2 here and here there is no V1. So, that is why you are getting actually strictly upper triangular matrix. So, this is some elementary fact from linear algebra. So, that you will be able to check comfortably. For example, this is also one can check uh, by f by the following fact, okay, the dimension of V modulo W will be exactly dimension of V minus dimension of W. So, in particularly, so the number R plus K will be exactly equal to dimension V. Okay. So, all you need to check this is actually linearly independent. So, that is also easy to check, maybe just I will write it as suppose alpha 1 U 1 plus etcetera alpha R U R plus etcetera beta 1 v 1 plus etcetera beta k v, v k. If this is 0, then what you can do? You can just go modulo w, okay? just to go modulo w. Then this equation will give you immediately beta 1 v 1 plus w plus etcetera plus beta k v k plus w, this is 0. So, that implies that beta i's are all 0 because v 1 bar etcetera v k bar that is actually a basis for, for the quotient. So, then that would imply alpha 1 u 1 plus etcetera plus alpha r u r is 0. So, again u i's are all basis for w. So, that would imply that alpha 1 alpha j is 0 for j equal to 1 to r. So, this proves that if you have a linear least algebra okay inside uh, uh, your gl of v such that each element of uh, this uh, linear release algebra is nilpotent linear transformation on v so then using this proportion one can get uh, a vector non zero vector such that that annihilated by all elements of g so using this and by induction on the dimension of v we, we will be able to construct comfortably a basis of capital v such that uh, with respect to that basis each element of G looks like strictly upper triangular matrix. So, basically uh, modulo this proportion we have actually proved uh, this Engels theorem. So, maybe I will stop here because uh, we are running out of time. So, I will continue the Engels theorem proof uh, in the next class. Thank you.